Migrating your applications to the cloud offers lots of benefits, such as improved agility, scalability, reliability, security, and cost optimization. But we know this, what customers struggle with is knowing where to start and whether they need someone to do it for them. What if I told you, you can do it yourself? My name is Ahmad Omaran, I'm a specialist solutions architect focusing on migration and modernization at AWS. I spend my time helping enterprise customers to successfully migrate significant workloads to AWS. In this session, we will use an example of an online store application. I will walk you through different migration options applicable for this application, and then migrate the application to AWS, demonstrating different migration tools. So you can take these lessons back and do it yourself. This is a 300 level session, so I assume you have a previous knowledge of AWS, as I will not cover any fundamental concepts. I will focus more on the hands-on part, so expect less slides and more time for the demo. You will learn different migration options that might be applicable for your first applications that you are planning to migrate. And finally, learn how to use available AWS migration tools and migrate a typical web application. So let's start with the source application. As you see on the slide, we are talking about Symbol Online Store, which allows users from all over the world to buy unicorns. This online store consists of a web server, which is running on a LAMP stack, where we have Linux operating system, Apache HTTP server, connected to MySQL database, and using PHP as the programming language. On top of PHP, we have WordPress as a content management system with WooCommerce, which is an e-commerce plugin. We have also a file server, which is used to store the WordPress content, including plugins, custom functions, and images. As you can see, there is a single point of failure in this architecture. This application is not designed to scale and customers experienced several outages due to heavy traffic. Our goal is to migrate this application to AWS and make it highly available and scalable. Before we start the migration, let's look at the different migration options for each component. Let's start with the web server migration options. Starting from the bottom of the slide, one of the most common options is rehosting, also known as lift and shift where you migrate a server to EC2 instance without any change in the operating system or the application layer. Rehosting can be automated with tools. There are many tools available from AWS and our partner ecosystem. As an example, cloud indoor migration and server migration service are free tools from AWS that can help accelerate the rehosting process. The second option is replatform. This is where you make a few cloud optimization in order to achieve tangible benefits. You may be looking to eliminate the undifferentiated heavy lifting of server management by migrating to AWS Fargate, which is serverless compute engine for container, or migrating your application to a fully managed platform like AWS Elastic Beanstalk, where you upload your code and the service automatically handles the deployment from capacity provisioning, load balancing, auto scaling, to application health monitoring. The third option is refactor, where you take full advantage of cloud native service, such as AWS Lambda and Amazon EBI Gateway to build a serverless architecture and improve agility, performance, and scalability. On top of the slide, you see the repurchase option, moving from the traditional web server to a software as a service product from AWS Marketplace and just migrate your data. AWS provides you with a mapping assistant tool to find the appropriate marketplace product for your application. As you can see, there are many options to choose from. There is no right or wrong in which path to choose, but it depends on how much effort, time, cost you need to, to spend, and of course, the business driver. Since I already have the web server container image available, I decided to choose the re-platform option and move to AWS ECS Fargate, where IT teams focus more on the application, not the infrastructure. For the database, we have two options, 
First option is Replatform, where we migrate database to AWS Managed Service. This can be done through Backup and Restore, which is a potential option for small database, and if we can afford longer plan downtime. Or we can use AWS Database Migration Service, which allows continuous data replication to minimize the downtime. The other option is rehosting. That can be done in a couple of ways. Similar to the web server, we can use migration tools to migrate the whole system with the database to an EC2 instance. The other way is to build the database on EC2 instance and do the backup and restore for the source database, which again is, is applicable for small databases and where longer planned downtime is acceptable. I decided to choose the replatform option with the DMS and move to a managed database, which will provide me with a lot of benefits, such as automated failover, backup and recovery, and patching. Also, DMS allows for continuous replication to minimize the planned downtime required for the cutover. For the file server, we have two options. First is rehosting, which again can be done in different ways. We can use migration tools to migrate the whole system to an EC2 instance and then reconfigure the NFS share. The other rehost approach is to launch and configure the EC2 instance and then use the AWS data sync to perform secure online data transfer. Another option we can use for the file server migration is replatforming where we move to a managed Elastic file system. This can also be done using AWS DataSync since it can transfer hundreds of terabytes and millions of files at speed up to 10 times faster than open source tools. I decided to choose the Zari platform option using AWS DataSync and move to Amazon EFS, which will provide me with lots of benefits, such as scaling on demand without disrupting the application, and eliminating the need to provision and manage capacity. To recap, this is the migration strategy for my application. We'll run the web server on AWS Fargate with Amazon ECS utilizing my existing web server container image. For the database, we will migrate to a managed database service, Amazon RDS, using AWS database migration service, and finally, the file server will be migrated to Amazon EFS using AWS DataSync service. This is the expected target architecture post-migration. As you can see, we have two availability zones, three subnets in each availability zone, one private subnet for the database and Amazon EFS, another private subnet for the AWS Fargate, and finally, public subnet for the load balancer. Now let's move to the demo. To focus on most interesting element, I have already created the target VPC, the required security groups, target database, and the load balancer. In the demo, I will start with the database migration using AWS DMS. Then I will create Amazon EFS volume and migrate the, EF, the NFS share to EFS volume using AWS DataSync. At the end, I will create the Amazon ECS cluster, task definition, and service to run the application. So let's jump into the demo. From AWS Management Console, let's navigate to Amazon RDS. I have already created the target database in preparation for the migration. As you can see, I decided to use Aurora MySQL because it provides high performance comparing to the standard MySQL database. I also saved all the database details in AWS Systems Manager Parameter Store, so I can use it later on during the migration. Let's go to Systems Manager and select Parameter Store. As you can see, these are all the database parameters that I will use it later in the demo. Now let's start the database migration by navigating to AWS Database Migration Service or DMS. DMS consists of three main components, replication instance, endpoints, and tasks. Let's start with the DMS replication instance, which is a managed EC2 instance hosting one or more replication tasks. I will create a replication instance 
and then gives the replication instance a name and description. I will leave the default instance type and the DMS version engine as well as the storage. For the VPC, I will select the target VPC that I created for the target environment prior to the demo. In the advanced security and network configuration, I will choose the security group that I created earlier for the replication instance, which is used in target database security group to allow access from replication instance to the target database. Now the replication instance configuration is completed. Let's click Create. It will take a couple of minutes for replication instance to become available. Now let's create the endpoints for source and target databases. In this demo, my source database is MySQL and target database is Amazon Aurora for MySQL. I will start with the source endpoint and will give it a name. Then I will select the source database engine, in this case MySQL. Server name is a source database DNS or IP address. Since it is my SQL database, port is 3306. And then I will add the username and password for the source database. Finally, we can verify the connectivity to the source database by running a test to the source endpoint. The connection test will be done on the actual replication instance used for copying data. It will take few seconds to connect and verify the connection. Now I will continue with the target database endpoint. Since my target database is an RDS database instance, I will choose select RDS database instance, which provides me with a list of RDS instances existing in current AWS account to choose from. I will select my target database instance, which automatically populates the endpoint configuration, including the target engine, server name, and port. I just need to add the password for my target database, and now I can verify the connection for the target database. The last step in the DMS process is creating a task. To move the data from the source endpoint to the target endpoint. When creating a task, you need to provide a task identifier. I will give it a name and then I will select the created replication instance, the source endpoint, and target endpoint. In the migration type, I can specify one of the following options. Migrate existing data. In this option, any changes to your source database will not capture. Migrate existing data and replicate ongoing changes. In this option, DMS will capture the changes while migrating your existing data. Replicate data changes only, which replicate changes after initial bulk load of data. I will select Migrate Existing Data and Replicate Ongoing Changes option since I want to minimize the downtime during the cutover. As you can see, there is a note in the console which indicates that binary log must be enabled and set to row to replicate ongoing changes. I have already configured that for the source database prior to the demo. In the target table preparation mode, I will select do nothing as I have already imported the schema to the target database before this demo. I will enable validation which will run a comparison between source and target data and report any mismatch. As a best practice, I will enable CloudWatch logs to log information during the migration process. In the selection role, we can choose the schema or specific tables that we want to include or exclude in migration task. For this demo, I will add the schema name. Now we are ready to create the DMS task. Application will take time based on the database size. Once the load is completed, 
the DMS will keep the replication running to capture changes in the source database and replicate them to the target database. To check the validation state, let's click the replication task, then go to Table Statistics. As you can see, the tables already fully loaded and validated. Now we have completed the database migration, let's navigate to EFS and start the file server migration. Before I start the file server migration, I need to create EFS volume. Let's start create file system. I will give it a name and I will select the target VPC that I need the EFS volume to reside on. Now I need to create a mount target for this EFS volume. So I will navigate to the network tab and then choose create mount target. I will select my target VPC where I need the ECS task to connect to my file system. For high availability, I will select two availability zones, the private subnets, and then I will select the security group that I created for the EFS, which allows inbound access from the ECS task. The mount target will take few seconds to become available, then we can start the file replication using AWS Datasync. I will navigate to AWS Datasync, AWS Datasync consists of three different components. The agent, which you need to deploy in the source environment. Locations, which are the source and destination file systems. And finally, the task, which is the relationship between the source and destination file system. I have already deployed and registered the agent before this demo. So let's start with creating location. I will start with the source file system, which in this case NFS. I will choose the existing agent, then add the NFS server IP address, and finally specify the mount path. I have my web server terminal open. Let's look at the existing mount path exported by the NFS server. I will copy the mount path and use it, which means I am telling the data sync the location of my files that I need to replicate from the file server. Now I will repeat this step to create the destination location. In this case, the destination location is EFS file system. Then I will choose the file system that I created in the previous steps. I will leave the mount path empty as I need to replicate files to the root path. Since I created both source and destination locations, let's create a task. In the source locations options, I will select choose an existing location. Then I will select my source locations that I created in the previous step. I will repeat this step for the destination location and finally give the task a name. As you can see, there are a lot of options that I can modify for the replication task, such as permissions, ownership, or file management lifecycle. I will keep the default values for now and finally review the task configuration and create the task. Task is available now, so let's start it. Status will change from launching to transferring and finally to success once the data is in sync. Now we need to build the web server and connect everything together. Let's navigate to the Elastic Container Services or ECS. I have already a container image of my web server in Amazon Elastic Container Registry, or ECR, which is based on the official image from the WordPress. To build the web server, let's create first the ECS cluster. Since I'm planning to use Fargate as my launch type, I will select networking only template to create my cluster. I will give the cluster a name, then I will click create. The cluster is active now and ready to use. In order to run Docker container in Amazon ECS, I need to create task definition. A task definition is the blueprint for my container where I can specify several parameters including the Docker image, CPU, memory, networking mode, and environment parameters. Let's create a task definition. I will select the Fargate launch type since I need to run my container on Fargate instead of managing EC2 instances. I will give the task definition a name and choose the task role required for the task. In this case, we will allow ECS task to access EFS and parameter store by updating ECS task execution role, which I already done earlier. 
with the network mode by default Fargate uses AWS VPC. Now we need to specify the task size. For this demo, I will select 1 gig for memory and 0.5 vCPU. Before we add the container image details, let's add the EFS volume that we created before. I will select add volume and choose EFS for the volume type. Let's give the volume a name, then select the file system ID and finally, as per best practice, enable the encryption in transit. Now let's go back again to add container, provide a name to the container and provide the repository URL for the container image. In our case, we have the container image in ECR, so let's get the URL from the ECR. We need to specify a memory limit for our container. As a starting point, I will add 400 as a soft limit. For the port mapping, I will use port 80 for the container port. And then I need to add environment variables, such as the target database username, password, database name, and DNS. Since I used AWS Systems Manager Parameter Store to store all these parameters, I can use value from option to pull all the value from parameter store and inject it into container at the runtime. So I will get the parameter name from parameter store and repeat that for the rest of parameters. Now in the storage section, I will select the mount point and add the container path, which should be the same that the source web server uses. So let's connect to the source web server and get the mount path. We have now just completed all the required configuration for the container, and I will add the container to the task definition and finally create the task definition. We have the task definition ready and now we need to run number of instances of the task definition simultaneously in Amazon ECS cluster. In order to do that, we need to create a service which will maintain the desired number of tasks and we can run the service behind the load balancer to distribute the traffic across the task. Let's navigate to our cluster and select create under the service tab. In the service configuration, I will choose far get launch type. It will automatically pick my task definition that I created in the previous step. In the platform version, I will choose version 1.4 which support EFS integration. Then I will provide a name for the service. Let's call it unicorn service. In the number of tasks, I will add two tasks and will leave the default for the remaining configuration and I click next step to move to the network configuration. In the network configuration, I will select the target VPC for the cluster and then select two private subnets for my tasks. In the security group, I will choose the ECS task security group which allows inbound access from the load balancer. In the load balancer section, I will choose application load balancer, which I have created prior to the demo. Next, I will add the container port to the load balancer. Then I will select port 80 as a listener port. And finally, selecting the target group that I created for the load balancer. Finally, I will click next step to configure the auto scaling. Auto scaling configuration is optional, but in this demo, I will choose to configure the auto scaling. So let's choose two as minimum number of tasks and for the desire, I will leave it at two as well. In the maximum, let's make it 20 tasks as an example. For scaling policy, you can decide which metric that you need to choose to trigger the auto scaling. And you might have many of these policies. In this demo, I will choose to trigger the auto scaling based on number of requests. So I will choose the application load balancer request discount as a service metric and let's enter 300 as my target value now the service is ready let's click next to create the service it will take few seconds to create the service let's have a look now at the service created as you can see there are two tasks in pending state and it will take few seconds to move from pending to the running state Let's get the load balancer DNS to check the application 
and make sure it's running and the target database and EFS is migrated successfully. As you can see, the application is running from our load balancer. Now we successfully migrated our online store application to AWS. Let's get back to the presentation to wrap it up. Migration is not the end of the journey. Continuous optimization is key to successfully operate in the cloud. I would recommend looking at AWS Well Architected Framework. In this session, we covered different migration options for a typical web application. I learned how to use AWS Database Migration Service to replatform database to a managed service with minimal downtime, how to use AWS DataSync to securely migrate data into AWS, and finally, how to use Fargate to run web tier in container and eliminate the undifferentiated heavy lifting of server management. Now, it's your turn to try it. If you are interested in boosting your migration skills and want to do it yourself in a risk-free environment, please visit the application migration with AWS Workshop, which will provide you with all the artifacts and step-by-step -step guidance. I really appreciate your time and thanks for watching.